Hello, uh, Jim Howard here in Fort Worth, Texas. Today's date, it's April 20th, uh, 2019, and it's about 4.30 p.m. <clears throat> p.m. Let me switch this so I can see what you can see, hopefully. I saw this article on uh, CNN news section. Uh, here in the United States, in case I'm not, for those of you who are not in the United States, you know, we have the federal government, we have a House and a Senate, you know, we have three branches of government. So, we, you know, the House and the Senate, that's Congress or our, our legislature. And sometimes the... Congress comes up with, or something's proposed, or things, and sometimes they pass, and now especially since the last election, things uh, are proposed that you think, my God, how stupid. And sometimes some of those stupid things pass. But we have 50 states, and of course there's Puerto Rico. Uh, well, there's also some other islands and stuff, but we have 50 states. So we have 50 state legislatures. And you'll see on CNN or in the newspapers or whatever, sometime something is sometimes passed. There are some crazy stuff that is passed. And, but there's even more insane stuff that is proposed by these state legislatures. Uh, and it just makes you wonder, I mean, it just, I'm in Texas, and right now, maybe they've given up on the idea, but just recently, there were some state legislators who are proposing that a law be passed in Texas <clears throat> that any woman who has an abortion I will be charged with homicide, murder, and they want the death penalty. Now, of course, they proposed it, and I, <clears throat> my voice is going. <laughs> I, uh, I doubt there's very many, but there are. You know, it's more than one person in the Texas state legislature that's trying to get that law, try to get that passed as a law. I, I mean that's mind-boggling, stupid, but it's not going to, you know, it's not going to be enacted as law. Um, and if it if it was, the United States Supreme Court would strike it down, you know, immediately. But that just gives you an idea of some of the insanity that happens in state legislators, in state legis in the... Uh, legislature of states. But this other one I just threw in here is I, uh, because I don't have any script, but I saw this just a while ago. Washington State Senator uh, says that nurses play cards for a considerable amount of the day. Uh, I guess there was a law passed uh, anyway this senator has uh, she said that nurses in smaller hospitals probably play cards for a considerable amount of the day uh, Washington State is has considered a bill which would provide nurses with uninterrupted meal and rest periods and this is what this Senator, she, you know, she objects to that. Probably the uh, hospital associations in that state and maybe out of the state are probably making donations to her uh, saying, you know, I wanted, you know, the Hospital Association of Washington State or whatever is probably, uh, I'm guessing, I mean, why else? 
Uh, and we have federal laws and state laws that, you know, if you work uh, eight and a half hours or whatever, you have to be provided with lunch. Uh, you're entitled to a couple breaks of 15 minutes or something. You know, it, I'm sure it varies by state. And what I actually worked at a hospital, and I filed a uh, a, a grievance. I'll get it. Maybe I should go to that too, just to show you how the system works, or it should work, or something. But I spent 30 plus years working hospital security at a bunch of different hospitals. And I worked at small hospitals, a couple big hospitals. Well, first hospital I worked at, a Catholic hospital, 300-bed hospital. Uh, second hospital I worked at was, I think, 350-bed hospital. Uh, the next hospital I worked at was 550, I believe, beds. The next hospital I worked at was a small hospital owned by the big hospital that I <coughs> was working at. And it was, I think, a 40-bed hospital. I think that I can't remember exactly, in order to get that hospital built, the other hospital had to agree to transfer, you know, take out a service, 40 beds or something. And because of, the, there was legislation in order to hold down hospital costs, which never works. You know, trying to hold down hospital costs, you need a czar, we need a socialist form of sort of government or something, rather. <clears throat> no matter what, because I saw it in those 30 years, the hospitals say, or the state sets up a thing, say there's too many hospital beds, and the hospitals are charging because of they have all these beds available, and if, if we can keep more beds from being built because there are no, you know, you don't need them, and anyway, this commission will decide if you. If this community needs more hospital beds added or hospitals built or whatever, and in this case, this hospital transferred, you know, said, well, okay, we will transfer to this other hospital we want to build, and they built that. But <clears throat> so far as holding down hospital call, you know, okay, there's too many unnecessary surgeries being done in the hospital. They could be done at... Uh, some other smaller facility, you don't need this, you know. So hospitals, you know, formed corporations that were part of the hospital but separate because it was a corporation, you know. And then they built surgery center, surgical centers that are located sometimes on the same, well, it couldn't be the same, you know, it's right next, it's right there, you know. But it's not on hospital property, it's on the property right next to it, and they do they do the surgeries, and same with uh, dialysis treatment. Oh, these, <clears throat> it's just too expensive having all these dialysis patients go every day and have dialysis done, so they shouldn't, so the hospitals set up, a, you know, and they build all over, you know, town dialysis centers to, if the people can go there and be hooked up to a machine all day long that's pumping their blood out running it through a cleaner and pumping it back into them. That's really terrible, by the way. I don't know if it sounds as bad, you know. It's really uh, bad. I mean, it's hard on those patients. I mean, they set them in nice, fantastic, nice chairs and have television set right there, maybe Internet now, I don't know. It's still traumatic for those patients. So if you can be an organ donor, please be an organ donor. Um, anyway, they just keep dialysis centers, all type, you know. The hospitals and the medical, they're going to make <clears throat> money, and no matter what laws you pass, unless you have something, and anytime you have Republicans having anything to do with the government, 
they're in favor of the corporations. They're in favor of, you know, what, you know, they're, and they're going to cut regulations, you know. They're going to unregulate things. And then when the Democrats come in, they try to, but if they have the Republicans in the legislature, then their hands are sort of tied. But the Democrats will try to put, you know, more regulations into effect or whatever. But it's a, almost a losing battle. But back to the, back to the hospitals here. So anyway, there are state laws of people need to be allowed a, you know, lunch break and Two, it breaks down to, you know, hospitals, well, businesses, but let's take hospitals. Hospitals will have, you know, 12-hour shifts, 8-hour shifts, and if there's a nurse shortage, which there usually is, because being a nurse is hard, you know, it's hard, dirty work. I didn't tell you all the hospitals I worked in. The small hospital that I've just worked up to that point, the 40-bed hospital, uh, when I started there, the hospital had just opened. And so there were nights when the ER got, <clears throat> the emergency room got very little, you know, very few patients in the beginning. And uh, there was two nurses, and uh, anyway, hospitals hold the staff down to the bare minimum. If you're the charge nurse, you know, during that, you know, hospital sort of run Monday through Friday on the day shift, you have a ton of people, and everything is set up, the disaster plan, the tornado plan, uh, all these plans are all designed uh, for uh, when they do the disaster drills and that type of thing. It's it's for Monday through Friday during the daytime. That's when they draw up their plan. If such and such happens, you know, if there's an earthquake or massive flooding or nuclear whatever, this is what's going to happen. Uh, we will declare, you know, over the public address system and then the switchboard operators you know will be notifying people that they need to come you know they need to come in and the hospital administrator and the assistant administrator and the uh, director of nursing and the director of purchasing and the director of the dietary they and blah blah, blah all these but they all assemble in the administrative wing of the whatever, and then they will be there and the hospital administrator will, you know, you know, assign and there will be volunteers and the some of the, house, the housekeeping staff and others, they will respond to there and they will be told where to go and what, you know, what to do, how to help out, and they have all these plans. When do the fucking disasters happen? They happen at night probably on the midnight shift. Uh, that's, you know, and they don't plan for them, you know, like, well, it wasn't a disaster, but bomb threat. I'm working at the small hospital. We get a bomb threat call. Okay, the bomb threat call comes into the hospital. There is no switchboard operator on the midnight shift. The switchboard has left and switched over, and it rings up onto the nursing unit on the second floor that takes care of the 40 patients. They have two or three nurses. That's another, you know, the charge nurse or whatever who's in charge looks at how many patients do you have, you know. Okay, well, we can get by with, so don't come into work to some nurse or they'll call in. Somebody say, well, you need to come in, like the ICU unit that that hospital had six ICU units, and I, I think if there was one ICU patient, I think maybe two, can't remember for sure, if there was one ICU patient and there was one ICU nurse, you know, one, one nurse can really not do a code when a code happens, and a code is very likely 
Now, I think if they had two, maybe there was one ICU nurse. Now, if they went to three patients, then they had to have two ICU nurses. Uh, I forget, but anyway, the poor charge nurse on nights and weekends and whatever is the one who has to decide on staffing, and they want to keep the staffing as low as possible. Uh, but back to this this thing, when the small hospital that I was when I was working there, when we started out, there was evenings where the uh, nurses had some duties they had to perform, even if they didn't have, you know. There's things you have to do. There's things I had to do. Uh, so there, in the beginning, they, the, those nurses sat there on the midnight shift, and they knitted or crocheted or did something like that. But there was also other things they had, you know, that they had to do. But then at that small hospital, eventually the ER was busy non-stop with two two nurses and, you know, ER doctor. In the beginning, the uh, lab was there all night, but there was no respiratory therapy or x-ray, so when somebody came in that needed respiratory therapy, blood gas drawn, or, uh, you know, be hooked up to a vent or whatever, they had to be called in, radiology had to be called in. Uh, so there was there was nights, when I, and I was, in my beginning, I was working eight-hour shifts, five of them. Then eventually I got on two 12-hour shifts and two eight-hour shifts. Uh, things changed, you know, changed around. But uh, there was, and then, too, when the ER was busy with patients, if it got quiet at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. in the morning, nurse and the doctor, a lot of the doctors, though, did their charting when, but the nurses would have to be doing charting. And a lot of the nurses got carpal tunnels. Uh, they had to do charting. They had to do charting. They would be, you know, a tremendous amount of charting that they had things that they had to put, you know, put into the chart. They'd be doing that. Uh, I would bring in food quite often. Well, sometimes I would take my car, run over, and pick up a bunch of some food and bring it over for the ER, you know, put it in the ER. I'd always bring in a, kept it supplied with a large jar of hot pickles and and, uh, and stuff. There's times when the ER was busy and, you know, and then at about 3, 4 a.m. in the morning, it was the patients were gone and we weren't getting a patient. And the nurses were charting like crazy. And I would say, I'm going to run over to the country kitchen and pick up breakfast. Sometimes I would pay. Sometimes a doctor would pay. Sometimes each of us would pay. Uh, I'm going to run over to the country kitchen pick up, you know, breakfast for us at the country kitchen. It was right across the highway. I'd go over. I'd call ahead, of course, to make sure. So I could just go over. i go over. i get them, bring them back to the ER. And uh, when I'd go in the ER, the ER would have one or two patients, maybe just one patient, but they would be, the nurses would be busy. I would, I'd eat my breakfast, (laughs) and they would either have to, you know, wait until later and then warm it up, or maybe they could go in, you know, in between, they check the blood pressure, and they give them a shot, and they hook them up to oxygen, and they'd come in and scoop a couple, you know. So, uh, God, I can't stand to look at myself that So, uh, there are, and two, working the midnight shift, uh, 
other shift, like the day shift, you know, of places will think, oh, well, you know, oh, the midnight shift, they don't have... In fact, the day shift would... Uh, well, let's take security. The day shift would... Uh, if something a security is supposed to do, like, you know, uh, gas up the patrol cars or whatever, let the midnight shift do it, you know. They... You know, they don't have anything to do. And, you know, we're the day shift and it's busy, you know, and whatever. They'd put that off on the midnight shift. Of course, at the big hospital that I worked at before I worked at this, you know, they would have on the day shift seven or eight security officers. Plus they had all the support people that they could, you know, call you know call on. Uh, at that hospital uh, that was in a bad neighborhood, uh, in really bad neighborhood. I mean, we're talking about, you know, bad. Um, you'd have seven or eight security officers on the day shift. And then you'd have, you know, a few less on the second shift. And then on the midnight shift or the graveyard shift, uh, and I worked down there, well, five years, and I'd come back later on and worked a year. But on the midnight shift, there was many, many nights when we had just three security officers for the hospital, you know, for the entire place. For a hospital, there was apartment comp. There was apartments there where there was a nursing dorm that was there. Uh, all you know, and there was three of us. And one of them, one of the officers, of course, had to be, you know, in at the emergency room. And it was just, and I can remember midnight shifts that, remember midnight shifts going in where we responded nonstop from one emergency situation. Well, I don't want to call, I don't want to call them emergency situation because... I don't like the word being used because sometimes you have like a, like I worked at one hospital where we had a director of security that wanted to run to places or he just, you know, to hit. That's a different story and I've told it in part. But where we actually responded to one situation and in another situation and another, you know, a patient, combative patient that had to be, you know, restrained. Uh, somebody uh, breaking into a car. Uh, someone peeking into the nursing dorm. Uh, one, just one thing after another. And there was three people on the, sh on the, you know, the midnight shift. Back to this. Uh, there are state, you know rules and federal rules about people being paid for over eight hours, you know, if you work. Then there's also the uh, thing with the hot, with the hospital, what other companies do, they, uh, you know, employers, they're going to do everything they can to screw the employee, everything. Maybe there are some good employers. Well, before I worked hospital security, I worked as a welder for years, uh, built railroad cars or rebuilt railroad cars, uh, built trucks, and uh, some of those companies paid really well and had great benefits and were great companies to work for, uh, like the KW Dart Truck Company. KW for Kenworth. They had two factories in the Kansas City area. I don't know how many other factories they had, but, you know, the one factory there, they made the Kenworth over-the-road trucks. And then the factory that I worked in, we made the gigantic mining trucks where, you know, I'm sure you've seen pictures of that or maybe some movies or something where you're seeing mining being done in these trucks. And, you know, the you'll see a person standing by the, you know, a grown man standing by the wheel and or, and the, the wheel is up, you know, is up here or whatever. I mean, big trucks. I worked in the body 
shop division where we made, and it was a good company to work for. It was a unionized place, of course. Uh, I was in the United Auto Workers. We had great pay, great benefits. But then you have the... I just happened to see something the other day that a dollar store, and there's a bunch of different companies we have in the United States and maybe, we're, I don't you know, in the United States. I know they must have in Canada too because there's a dollar store bias and it's owned by a, a Canadian uh, company. Nice store. and Everything in there is a dollar. And well, of course, they've got some canned goods that they can't charge a dollar for that are less, but nothing more than a dollar. But and I'm sure it's not this store. I hope it's not this one. I saw on the news where uh, the company had come up with the idea that they'll make every one of their employees a manager. And that way they can just fuck them over. I mean, you know, you, the, the rules on the, you know, the federal rules and other rules will say, okay, you know, this is for employees. But now managers, you know, they're, okay, that's different because they're part of management. So this store, I don't think they're they're not going to be allowed to do it. I'm sure they'll probably end up in big trouble. That's, but they just made every employee there, you are a manager. Anyway, um, So when I worked, times I was working security, uh, sometimes I was working eight-hour shifts, and then sometimes it was an eight-and-a-half-hour shift. You know, the in other words, they, when I worked the eight-hour shift, you know, I was paid for eight hours' work, but I was still entitled to a lunch period and a couple break periods. When uh, I worked, and I was working 12-hour shifts, I was entitled to, you know, sometimes it was 12-and-a-half-hour shifts. But I was entitled to, but our nurses playing cards. Well, that's ladies, you know. Yeah, sometimes they probably are pay, playing cards. Uh, but or knitting, you know. But she doesn't really know what she, you know, you know, she doesn't, I've worked, those nurses, and some of them were older than I was when I was working at the small hospital, and I especially liked my shift of, the nurses liked at that hospital for the emergency room, they liked, the nurses on the floor, they worked eight-hour shifts. They, uh, I think actually maybe eight and a half, and then they, you know, but um, the, um, the uh, nurses in the emergency room, they liked the 12 hour shifts. And they would work a bunch of 12 hour shifts. I forget how many. And then it, because of a two week period, and as long as they didn't go over, uh, it'd be what, 40, 80 hours then they didn't have to pay them overtime, so the hospital didn't really care if you want to do it, you know. And uh, a lot of the nurses, they liked that where then they got several days off, you know, in a row. And then if you had holidays, you could maybe add a holiday on to it or whatever, and it worked out. And I liked my two 12-hour shifts. 12 hours is a long time. But when I worked those two 12-hour shifts, then the next two shifts were eight hours. And it went in, and when I went in, eight hours seemed like, oh, this is nothing after working a 12-hour shift. But let me tell you, those ER nurses who were working the 12-hour shifts, there sometimes they worked nonstop, two of them. Now, they had a house supervisor. In the beginning, there was no house supervisor. The house, at night, the house supervisor was one of the ER nurses. And so... You you, know, you have a, two ER nurses. One of them at night is also the charge nurse, you know, in charge of. And so if the floor or ICU needed some medication that they couldn't get out of their 
supply that they had there, they would have to contact the e, you know the ER nurse, and she would have to go to the pharmacy, and then she'd have to get their medication that they needed and take it up to them. Meanwhile, the, you can imagine what the, you know, I actually went through EMT training, got certified by the state as an, and helped out in the emergency room a lot when I could, you know, when, when I could do it. Uh, you know, I wasn't required to do that. And out of the 25 security officers in our department, I was the only one that was an, you know, that was an EMT. But, I mean, I didn't stitch any of the doctors do this. I mean, I just would um, a few times take somebody's, you know, temperature, heart rate, and, you know, pulse and this kind of stuff and and whatever. Or uh, I would take the, when the sutures were done or whatever they did, I would take the, I'd get patients, you know, a blanket or put them in a wheelchair when they came in because there was no beds to put, you know, I did stuff like that to help out. But those nurses think if you're, you know, 50 or 60 years old and you're a nurse and you're working a 12-hour shift with no, you know, no break, you know, no break or, you know, whatever. And now when they finally got a charge nurse at night, you know, then she could, of course, she had to do staffing. How many patients do we have? And then, you know, the nurses would say, but this, you know, these three patients that we have, you know, they need to be moved and they're, you know, you know, turned and that kind of stuff and they're, you know, obese and whatever. And we got this and we got this uh, patient that has uh, Alzheimer's that keeps trying to get out of the, you know, the restraints or Sometimes they weren't in restraints because the doctor wouldn't authorize them to be put in restraints. And, you know, like when I was working hospital security several times, you know, I I mentioned that just in a video not long ago. You know, I'm making my rounds and 3 a.m. in the morning and there's some lady, you know, old lady, come out of fire exit from this, you know, she was a patient on the second floor or whatever, come out of fire exit and she's heading for the highway, you know, with her gown flapping or whatever, and I'd take her back up. Nurses work hard. They make good money. They're making, you know, better money. If you're a young person in, uh, you know, school, male or female, uh, look into being a nurse. It's hard work, and it's sometimes dirty work, but there is... Once you get into nursing and once you get through the school and once you get working at the hospital, there are plenty of jobs. You know, you can be working day shift, Monday through Friday, uh, and you can be the infection control nurse with your own office and with your doing paperwork, never hardly seeing a patient. Tumor registry, oh, there's just tons and tons of clerical type jobs and things you can do where you'll never have to slide a bedpan underneath somebody or, you know, whatever. Or you can be a charge nurse, although the charge nurses usually will kick, you know, will go and help. If, you know, if, but it's become, it is a mess. And, uh, so, she wants to exempt the uh, requirements that these nurses have to have, uh, you know, a lunch period and a break period and that type of stuff. And she says that uh, it would exempt uh, rural hospitals with less than 25 beds from the bill. I I never worked at a hospital that had, you know, fewer than 40 beds. That would be a small hospital, but still, like I told you, I just, it just drove me crazy when these hospitals would have these disaster, you know, 
drill things and they would do it Monday through it would be on a on a weekday when the you know oh I'm working at this small hospital uh, I was getting into that too phone call comes in bomb threat for the hospital there was no switchboard operator but the nurses up on the floor and there were maybe two or three at the most taking care of I don't know 25 patients or whatever and uh, you try taking care of, maybe you have a grandmother or something that's living with you and, you know, that's one, you know, to say she's elderly and thank God, you know, great, you're, you know, if you're taking care of grandma or whatever, but just think trying to take care of 25 and having to all the requirements of things that you have to chart, you have to measure their, you know, the their how much liquid they put in them, how much urine comes out of them, and just on and on and on. But, okay, hospital. Bomb threat comes in. No switchboard operator. The phones are switched over. One of the three nurses up on the floor answers it, and she nailed it. You know, a guy says, you know, there's a a bomb set to go off at your hospital. And she says, you know, where's the bomb located? And he says, in the emergency room. Click. When's it supposed to go When's it supposed to go off? And he said, uh, and I think it was like 15 minutes or something. You know, it's going to go off in 15 minutes. Click. Nailed it. Then I forget what, you know, there's probably, you know, he probably hung up then. So then she calls me, and she had the information, location. I was in the emergency room. I'd been in the emergency room because the emergency room had been a disaster. I'd been helping them for two or three hours, and I'd been right there. And she says, you know, she told me, and I said, whatever her name was, let's say Mary. Mary, thank you. You did just great. And so... There happened to be a police officer who was there, and he says, I'll, I'll notify the, you know, fire department. We'll have our, and I said, nope, we'll take care of it. I said, we're going to check everything here in the emergency room, you and I, okay? He says, fine. We only had 15 minutes anyway, you know, according to the thing. But I followed procedure, and I called the hospital administrator 3 o'clock in the morning or 4 a.m. or what. It was earlier, and it was later than that. You know, I called him, and he was new. Hospital medic. <laughs> and I said, you know, and he said, what's the procedure? And I said, well, the procedure is this is supposed to happen during the daytime, Monday through Friday, because that's when all these drills are done. And that's when the plans are all drawn up saying here, these people are to go. I said, you're supposed to be in the disaster control center with the entire hospital staff, the administrative staff, all those people are there. And you're telling them to do this and to do that. And whatever. I said, of course, this happens, you know, at night. And I said, uh, sir, do you want me to handle it? And he says, yes, Jim, please. And I said, okay. And so then I, you know, the police officer and I, we checked everything. There was a patient or patient and visitor earlier who had left up pissed off and mad. And when they left, I just had a feeling, oh, this is going to be... At the very least, we're going to get a a questionnaire sent back to us, you know, saying how terrible we were or whatever. But I'm sure that was, you know, the guy went home and, you know, fuck these people out, you know. I don't want to go into too much detail about bomb threats and procedures and that type. I'm not going to go into it. But, yes, I'm aware of possibilities, how things can be, and I don't want to go into that. You know, we are aware of it. Uh, I'm not going to go into it. Um, So, like I said, anyway, this lady's full of... Let me tell you, though, the problem is... All of these organizations, the hospital, you know, like I forget how many hospitals there were in the greater Kansas City area. 
must have been more than 18 because when I started working at this one hospital, they formed a corporation and they ended up buying 18 other hospitals in the Kansas City area that they then controlled. And then there were a few other hospitals that they didn't take over. I'm going to guess there's 25 hospitals in the Kansas City area. Let's say that. And they have an association. Well, that that's good, right? I mean, that's that's good that they join together and they can, you know, coordinate uh, for the safety and security and the health of the people. Isn't that good? Well, I, the first hospital I worked at, uh, the midnight shift security officer says, Jim, I want to show you something. And he, we had the key, of course, to personnel, human resource. Well, it was called personnel then. He had gone over into personnel and found laying on the desk a, no, he made a copy of the page. He found, I didn't know what he found, but he he brought in a, he showed me, that was it, he had it. Look, here's all the hospitals. Here's the starting pay for security officers. Here is the top average pay for security officers. Here's the top pay for security officers. Here's how many openings East Hospital has for that or whatever. I thought, wow, that's interesting. Then, uh, later, years later, at a, a different hospital, the midnight shift supervisor in security, the director of security was telling us, because we were at that hospital, Secure, we did everything. We did. It got where we did snow removal. Uh, we picked up patients' valuables. When you came into the hospital, if you had any valuables, you know, you'd be told, and we'd take them, lock them up. If you were going to surgery, because you would be out of your room, and you would be uh, maybe medicated, you know, when you came back to your room, not... So we would pick up your patient valuables, take them when you wanted them. We'd bring them back to your room if you wanted them. Or if you were just wanted them to be locked up to your left, we'd bring them to you. We were doing we were doing everything. And the director of security, who I've mentioned him before, I was going to say world's biggest liar. But I, since we've had a presidential election, I don't think I can say uh, biggest liar. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I don't know. Anyway, he told us we were, the, nobody asked, he told us that we were the highest paid security officers because of all the extra duties we were doing. And I thought, that's great, because we weren't the biggest hospital. That's great. Anyway, uh, the Midnight shift supervisor had gone into human resources and found the entire packet. And what it was was the hospital, Greater Kansas City Hospital Association, whatever it's called. They shared all this information, you know. So you had, you know, uh, RN1, RN2, 3, you know, uh, housekeeping 1, you know, different levels. And it had their pay, starting pay, their average pay, their top, there was something else in there their top pay, how many openings there were, so they could coordinate and make sure that they didn't pay too much, you know, and which is price fixing, I think, which is, I think actually would be illegal. But we weren't, I think we were either second or fourth in pay. We were up there quite a ways, but we were not the top hospital. And... Let me let me go into this is running kind of long, but you can always tune out. Let me go into this pay. Okay, Trinity Lutheran Hospital. I uh, three hundred and fifty bed hospital. I started there. That was my second hospital. I started there, started on the day shift. I came to work there. 
I knew exactly what, you know, what to do. I'd had a previous hospital experience. I came in. I knew exactly what to do. I was there five and a half years. I got fantastic merit reviews. I was uh, working there. I talked about how I became second shift supervisor and then went, I think went back to the day shift or what. Anyway, I'd gone to sec- second shift supervisor. I went back to, I was on the day shift or whatever. Didn't mind not being supervisor anymore. And they had me at some point because parking was being, parking is always disasters in hospitals. And they were building a fantastic new parking structure on one of our parking lots. So they had to open up a lot uh, about two blocks away from the hospital. And so our director of security, who, very bright man, super racist and uh, super big liar. And I never could understand why. And now, because of our current political situation, I think I've actually figured out why. I couldn't understand, because he lied about things that you didn't need to lie about. Uh, but anyway, so I'm scheduled to come in. I forget what a time, 4 a.m. in the morning, and I told him, uh, Mr. Ross, there's nobody going to be parking there at that time in the morning. There's plenty of parking, you know. No, I want you there. Okay. And he actually assigned a parking lot attendant. We had seven parking lot attendants on the day shift. So for an hour or so, I'm down there in the parking lot with the parking lot attendant, and uh, we're, you know, we're joking around, telling jokes to each other. I had some of the funniest uh can't remember the show. There was a show on TV back then about a small town, and the, the mayor the mayor was sort of like our director of security. And uh, I can't remember, it, you know, the, the mayor, and then they had the sheriff or whatever. And anyway, we were laughing our guts off down there, and then, and then the cars would start parking there. So then I would go home, and I forget, like 2 o'clock in the afternoon or something like that. Uh, but anyway, I was working that shift, and there should have been a, there was another security officer working with me, and then there was the supervisor, and the supervisor, a female, uh, she, she came in to socialize. But she did do a lot of work. If you know, but then she just if she picked up patient valuables, she would tell the you know the patient, oh you know call she give you know my name is such and such. Uh, you call when you call the office security office or whatever, uh, you tell them you know you you ask for me, and uh, she'd do that everything everything she did you know she'd say. You, here's my name. You ask for you know. You ask for me. I was working all the time. I, very rarely would I get up to the office. Maybe if my battery went dead, or, or I had to, or I had to get patient valuables or something. Then I go up the the place was next door, whatever the phone would ring and the person would ask for the you know by name for her and I you know she's not here right now in the office. Can I help you? Well, I need my. Va-. She said to call and I said. Okay, you know, I'll bring him, I'll bring your valuables down to you. And she just did that, but she was there mainly to socialize, but she did work. Uh, but she didn't go out and relieve anybody for, you know, breaks. Uh, she didn't go out and check the parking lots. Uh, she was there to socialize, but she did. I liked her. But so I came in in the morning. I did the parking lot for two hours down there or three or whatever it was. Then I came in and then I started doing everything else. Uh, And I ended up, I would be relieving for break. Well, they didn't ask really for breaks, you know. Uh, But, I mean, I'd go by occasionally, hey, do you need to take, you know, to the parking lot if they need to take a break or something, you know. But lunches were the big thing. And. I would be 
they're figured out. You know, seven parking lot attendants, uh, each one entitled to a 30-minute, you know, you know, because uh, you were working an eight-and-a-half-hour shift, being paid for eight. But it wouldn't matter. Even if you were just working an eight-hour shift, you were entitled to have a 30-minute lunch period. I would be, re- you know, relieving them. Sometimes I would, I would grab something to eat, and I would say, I'd have it, you know, go ahead and go ahead to lunch. And then I would eat my sandwich or whatever it was, hostess ho-ho or whatever it was, relieving somebody. And I did that for quite a I was doing that stuff for quite a while. And uh, then finally, I told the supervisor, I said, you know, I don't really, I'm working eight and a half hour shift. I'm only being paid for eight hours. I'm relieving everybody. Figure it out yourself. How can you relieve seven people during the lunch, during the time that, you know, whatever. And of course, I would be relieving. Sometimes I'd be, okay, two of you can go because I can watch this, the gate, you know, the control thing. And I can, I can cover, you know, doing all kinds of creative things. But still, I wasn't getting a proper, you know, lunch. And sometimes... The parking lot attendant or something, oh, Jim, uh, that's okay. I'll just, I just got something here in my lunch pail. You can go ahead, you know. And of course, that was not a proper lunch for them, if they're sitting there, you know, eating on duty or whatever. So finally, after months of this, anyway, on my activity sheet, every day I put down, you know, what all I did every 15 minutes or whatever, and no lunch. Now sometimes I didn't put down no lunch if I grab something and it was halfway decent and I got an entire 30 minutes just walking watching this the gate on the parking the entrance gate the exit gate to make sure they worked or helping somebody if they you know with their car didn't work or whatever but I put down you know no lunch so then finally remember I was coming in early in the morning and everything and I was going home before you know let's say it was two o'clock in the afternoon everybody else let's say went home at five or something because I was coming in you know so it's 2 o'clock, so I've worked 8 hours, but I have to work 8 and a half hours. But I'd worked 8 hours, of course, and it wasn't the first time, you know. I had no lunch. So I told the supervisor, okay, I'm leaving now. <clears throat> oh, no, you have to work till 2.30. And I said, but I've already worked 8 hours, and I haven't received any lunch. So I'm leaving now, and you can just, you know, put me down for, you know, lunch that I, uh, you know, pay me for lunch. No, you can't do that. And then I tried to explain to her, you know, this is the situation. I said, okay, let me get this straight. I've already worked eight hours. I haven't had any lunch. So what you are telling me is, let me do this here. I said, what you're telling me is, then that you expect me to sit here for 30 minutes in the office and eat my lunch and then I can time out and go home and she said yes sarcastically or you know maybe I was a little sarcastic I don't know I can't stand to see myself I need a robot that I could program that would do this what was that one on MVT TV or M, what was that, music video television or something? So I said, well, I'm going to do a grievance. I'm tired of this. And she said, well, go ahead and do a grievance. And I think I'd already done a couple of grievances and one. Maybe that, was, that wasn't my first grievance. I did four grievances while I was there, and I won all four of them because I, when I said something was the way it should be, it, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that if I didn't know I was 100% right and that I was going to win. And when I did the grievances, I would never ask for anything. And I wouldn't say, I I want a private office uh, with a secretary and uh, wearing a maid's costume, or I want the hospital administrator. If I, you know, I would do something that was 100% the, the, the personnel department and the hospital administrator, whatever. That's all he wants. And here I was, you know, all I wanted was what was 
So she says, well, just go ahead, which I never could understand. After, maybe the first grievance she could understand somebody saying, well, you know, because nobody did grievances, really. Uh, but so I said, okay. So that was a Friday. I know it was a Friday after all these years because we, we had this uh, departmental meeting, which we had every two or three months. And uh, so we all go into the meeting room. Uh, they, guys at home, of course, have been called and everything to come in. And then the director of security comes in, and he says, says he, I can't remember exactly, you know, Jim, uh, you go ahead and you just do that grievance. I already talked to the uh, Fernand Johnson, you know, human resources director, and he said, you're wrong. And I said, I said, Mr. Ross, you did not, Mr. R uh, Vernon Johnson did not say I was wrong. He's the head of human resources. He knows what the law is. He knows what procedure is. There's no way he would say that to you. And I talked, I called the hospital labor attorney, and he says, you are wrong. And I said, Mr. Ross, you did not talk to the hospital labor, you know, attorney. I said, I know those those lawyers, you know, represent corporations and big business, and they do their bidding, but there is not one of those people or any other labor attorney that anywhere in the United States is going to say that I am wrong. I'm 100% right. It's, that's it. That I'm 100% right. You're 100% wrong. You're not telling the truth. So the uh, next step, I did the grievance. No, so when I did the grievance, okay, I did that too. And it, when I did the grievance then, because he was being an asshole about it, I, you know, I'm entitled, here's the dates, and the, t you know, look at my activity sheets. I want to be paid for, you know, for those. And then I put also, you know, you've said that we're not allowed to leave the hospital, you know, for our 30 minutes. And I said, I want to be able to, you know, leave the hospital for 30 minutes, you know, and be paid and be able to do, you know, and. I put something else in there, and so so anyway, that went to him, and I had to meet with him, and he said, yeah, I've, you know, and I said, sure, you know, because the first step was meet with the, you know, okay, I met with him, then the next step was you go to the hospital, uh, head of human resources, Ronan Johnson, a great, a great guy, I went to him, and he said, Jim, he came down here and he told me, and he says, I told him, no, Jim is right, 100% right. He ha You have to pay him for these. You can't, you have to, you know, I told him that, and he wouldn't listen to me. And he said, I told him, I'm the head of human resources, and he wouldn't listen to me. And I said, you know, fine. You know, the next step is I go to, you know, the hospital administration. I actually didn't have to meet with the hospital administration at, on that grievance the hospital assistant administrator, because <laughs> the hospital assistant, oh, fuck, yeah, the guy is, you know, Jim's right, you know, yeah, and then I think that, if I remember, that's the time that I went up to the office, you know, I was told to come up to the office, and the director's office, office of the director of security, the director of human resources was there, and the assistant administrator of the hospital, who was over security, he was there. And the director of security said, oh, Jim, you know, well, yeah, you're right. And you'll be back. You'll be paid for that. And, you know, you're entitled to. Oh, that would piss me off, too. The director of security had put. When I did my grievance and I went to him, he said. I've you can't leave, you know, you can't leave the hospital for 30 minutes because uh, uh, you'd have to be back within 30 minutes and and you'd have to time out. And I knew that. You'd have to time out. you have to time back in. I knew that. And uh, he said, also, you can't leave the hospital in your uniform with your badge and your gun and everything. You'd have to change clothing. And I said, he said, 
uh, the police would uh, the police would arrest you for impersonating a police officer if you laughed at which is bullshit. And you know, I mean, he but so that's when I it put in there the fact that I could you know could leave and of course he had to you know. So it just happened that the hospital parking you know he they said you know okay you're going to be paid back pay. And you are entitled to leave the hospital for your 30 minutes and, you know, punch in and punch out. You don't have to change uniform or, you know, whatever, because that was fucking crazy. So uh, it just happened that the director of security wanted to, he always wanted to be part of the thing. Well, he very rarely, that was like, anyway, they were doing the parking lot. So he came down to make sure that the parking lot was being asphalted properly or whatever. And so... Uh, it was a weekend, Saturday or Sunday. So I went to Mr. Ross and I said, Mr. Ross, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck or anything, but uh, I'm going to run over to Taco Bell and pick up some lunch and bring it back. Uh, do you want me to get you something? And he said, no, Jim, that's okay. Uh, no, I, I, that's okay. And I said, okay. You know, like it was okay he'd eat. Not okay that I can go, but okay that, you know, I, uh, you know, it's, I don't need anything. And I said, okay. So I ran over, you know, timed out, went over Taco Bell and uh, brought food back and, you know, ate it. So I didn't do that every, you know, every day. It was just, and that was, that's the crap that you have to go through sometimes. The problem with that director of security was, well, there was a bunch of problems. And now that we have the president that we have, I see some things, well, the director of security was, he was super smart. And I don't know what his IQ was. I'm surprised he didn't tell me, you know, because he bragged about everything. But I see some things now because of the current president that we have that overlay. I think that they have, they had some of the similar problems but I was dealing with Mr. Ross at a time when his cosmic, 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 that his brain had not gone to the point that our current president's brain has gone to. Uh, so that's kind of interesting because I always... Until just recently, I didn't see the similarities. But now I see that if I had, this was like in the 19, uh, 1980s, I, no, 70, 1970s. So, because later on, uh, Mr. Ross, he lasted a long time working there, but then later on he was actually fired because of his mental state. I worked, not one of the hospitals I mentioned, up to. I worked at another, you know, I worked at several hospitals after that, but one of the hospitals I worked at well, Lee Summit Hospital. About a 250-bed hospital, I think. I worked there on the midnight shift. And uh, when, the he- when the head nurse would go to the pharmacy at night, she had a key and security had a key. So it took both keys to get in. And then I would go in with her, of course. And then we would talk a little bit. And then she said, you know, she said, uh, Jim, you uh, you worked at Trinity, didn't you? And I said, she said, did you know Mr. Ross? And I said, yes. I said, in fact, he fired me. And she said, well, I got him fired. And then I said, what happened? And she said she was a, a psych nurse, and she had been observing him, and then his behavior became, and then she wrote him up you know, and turned it into administration, and they let him go. So I think... If a long time ago I had seen 
I guess I'll mention his name. A long time ago, if I had been dealing with Donald Trump, uh, maybe he would have been uh, maybe he would have been smart, maybe he would have been coherent, maybe he could have put sentences together, he'd have been you know bragging about himself and he'd have, he'd have had some of the same things that Mr. Ross had, but he would have probably i would have i would probably would have said like you know hey, smart man uh, but with time and so I learned a little bit I guess anyway uh, I think I've co I think I've covered this thing I'll put a link to this by the way this thing here uh, did I mention yeah I think I did my God, I've been talking so long. I did mention about Texas wanting, yeah, I did. Some people in the Texas legislature wanting to pass a law if a woman had a has an abortion, she will be she will be charged with murder. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that. The other thing I think I wanted to mention was and I've mentioned about people say I repeat myself I yes good you know because sometimes you need to hit people nurses they work hard and the staffing, the way the staffing is done in order to hold down cost or whatever, they're they're not getting the... Remember, I was... I work, well, that was... Okay. Working one hospital. Like I said, I, <clears throat> I, I put down everything. You can't believe... You know, you, the hospitals want you to log everything to make sure you're not sleeping or whatever if you're a security officer. But they also want to know what you did. And... Uh, also, they're looking to see if you did something wrong, you know. You know, if you put down, let's see, I walked Mary Jane to her car at 3 a.m. And then I got in the car with her and uh, we did some necking. And uh, I went to, I got to second base with her and then I, then I got out of the car and then I went back to, you know, they, they're looking for you to put, you know, stuff to use against you. But actually... I don't know how many times, because I logged everything that I did. I don't, well, not everything I did, but I mean, you know, I logged. I mean, the time I stood in the middle of a waiting room and did a 360 degree and said, oh, you goddamn motherfucker, stay in this goddamn waiting room if you, you know, if you, if you, get, if you leave this waiting room this time, I'm going to throw your fucking asses out on the highway. I didn't log that. <laughs> um... But basically, I logged everything. I don't know how many times that on the activity sheet, you know, they were, they would have some type of a, something would come up and they would look and they'd say, well, wait a minute, no, you know. One time the supervisor called me. See, I worked, you know, at the hospital, the small hospital. They didn't even have security around the clock. I swore in the past that I would never work a security job where they didn't have security around the clock. Because that sucks big time. You come in if you're if you're just working midnights. Maybe I should show something else. My God. Let's go to. Let's go here. Uh, you're tired of looking at that lady's face. I'm gonna make. I'll make her. She'll be famous. Wow. Oh, man. Anyway, um, one time my super, and it was a, he was a very nice super, a very good supervisor, really nice guy. He called, I was surprised, too, that he's tall. Anyway, he called up and he said, uh, Jim, uh, the other, we got a complaint from a patient that the other day you were, 
uh, you were rude to him and you were insulting to him or whatever. And I said, no, I wasn't. I don't know which one you're talking about. Well, it's the one that you, that came down by helicopter to us, you know, life flight. Or I don't, they called their air, helicopter Eagle, you know. Came down by Eagle and I said, well, I still don't remember. What? You don't remember? It happened three, two, three days ago or whatever. I said, well, the... Eagle has transported quite a few patients from here. I said, I'll check my activity. Uh, you do that and and uh, whatever. And I said, okay. So, so I looked at my, anyway, I'm just getting the point that we're trying to get, that my activity sheet is, it helped me, this is just one example. I looked at, oh, okay, now, when I looked at my, okay, now I remember, you know. Uh, let's say, you know, they were 200 hours, uh, a uh, patient came into ER by ambulance, uh, non-responsive. Uh, I, and I forget, you know, I took family, to, you know, to the waiting room, whatever. Uh, patient is going to be transferred to Maine Research Hospital. ER staff had me call down to order the Eagle, you know, to come out. And in which case, I just didn't dial the phone and say, "You need," you know. I had to call and say, "Oh, 200 pounds. They got an IV in the right arm. They got another IV, you know, whatever, and uh, and all that kind of stuff." Um, so I, you know, put that, and then I, I put the uh, family ask me for directions to Maine Research Hospital. I gave them directions. Uh, I helped Eagle in with their cart and stuff. I actually wouldn't need any help with it. And, and then helped with the patient going out with the to the Eagle. And then I, uh, you know, had on there, I called the uh, security down at Maine Research Hospital and informed them that there was a family coming down with this patient or whatever. Then I had on my activity sheet, uh, patient, uh, that was, you know, left the, oh, by the way, I put non-responsive, you know, as patient was non-responsive. And I put, uh, patient left the, uh, the family left the boots behind for the guy. And I said, I called Maine Research Security and asked them to tell the family that we had the boots out here or whatever. So then uh, a couple of Uh, a couple of hours later, the family came by to pick up their, the guy came by to pick up his brother's boots. And uh, doing a zoom here, the camera is, or all of a sudden everything is not just with this, but Things are out of sync, I think, with the audio, and I'll we'll check and see. Anyway, I put, you know, the brother came by and picked up his boots, and he thanked me uh, for everything I had done to help, and he said he really appreciated it or whatever. So I put that down. So, uh, <laughs> and I sent the copy of the thing on down with a with oh that when the when the director or when the supervisor called, he said. Make a report. Send a report down on this. And I said, okay, you know, before I even knew what it was. So I wrote, you know, the report. Blah, blah, blah. Here's a copy of the attached, you know. And so then uh, Jim called me, you know, the next day, something out there, and said, oh, Jim. He said, I'm sorry. He says, uh, the guy didn't complain. He complained about security, but he wasn't complaining about you. He was complaining about the security officers down here, you know complaining about us and I said oh okay I, I, I thought it'd be kind of hard for him to be complaining or whatever because he didn't he was you know wasn't responsive the entire time he was here he says yep um, so the uh, doing that on the activity sheet but you know the the idea was they were going to 
all of the places that you're doing activity sheets. Uh, that hospital that I was talking about, the main one, uh, they, they had a nursing dorm there. And on the midnight shift, there was a security officer. And for, a, for years, it was a female security officer, which is okay. I actually had to, there for a while, I was relieving her two days a week. She worked five days a week. I worked there two days a week on the, at the nursing dorm. But anyway, she, she was there. She would come in, and she would fill her activity sheet out when she got there. She would, you know, she was on duty, on duty. Then she'd put down the times <laughs> that she checked the outside doors, the time that she did such and such. She would fill it out that she didn't have to, you know, work in midnight shift. I would keep mine up to date but then when it got time almost time to go home there's times oh my god uh, i would actually be nodding off trying to write in you know the act because it's so hard working the midnight shift i never slept on duty and i got where after a period of time what i did was even on my days off i stayed up all night long i uh would clean at home do different things at home, and then in the morning when I would normally be getting home from the hospital, that's when I went to bed. Now, if you have a family, you know, it's hard to do that. You know, the kid need to go to the school or, you know, or you need their stuff to do, and so I felt a lot of the nurses, a lot of the staff, it was hard to do. And then, too, there was a whole lot of them that would they'd come to work, oh, my God, I'm so tired, you know, um, my sister called me, and I said, why don't you turn off the phone? Well, my her mother is not feeling well, and I'm afraid, you know. And I said, don't those people know you work them? Well, they don't understand what it is to, and I said, well, yeah, I understand that. Anyway, I'm not sure if I covered what I wanted to cover or not, but I'm going to stop here, and the CNN webpage, man, they have some interesting stories here. Uh, that I want to check out. So, anyway, thank you very much for watching. I'm going to upload this video now. Thank you again very much for watching.